September 15th. The time is 3.39. I apologize for our tardiness. I call to order the committee of the whole meeting of the Birmingham City Council. At this time, counselors, um, we've had an opportunity, hopefully, to review the minutes of the past meeting of January 18th. Can I have a motion and a second for approval of those minutes? I move for approval. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, those minutes are approved. Thank you. We will follow the agenda as printed. Our first item for review or discussion is Avenue, and it will be presented by Acting Chief Financial Officer, Officer Aaron Saxton and company. <laughs> Thank Good you. afternoon. I'm uh, Aaron Saxton. I serve as Acting Chief Financial Officer. I'm accompanied here today by Attorney Yolanda Lawson. Um, Attorney Lawson is the manager of tax collections in the finance department. She has put together the avenue update that you have before you. Call her up to make the presentation at this time. And congratulations to you, Attorney Lawson. Thank Glad to see you, you Ms. Roll. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And at your discretion, President Alexander, I'm not sure if we want to address questions as we proceed through the presentation or if you would like to address them at the end. It's whatever it works for you as the facilitator. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So as an update to the City Council, of course we know that we have an ongoing contract with Avenue Insights and Analytics to provide tax collection support services for the City of Birmingham. And this is going to be a brief overview and update for you. As you see on page two, um, the basic overview is going to include designated, designated avenue contract for taxpayer and city, general license verification holds, real-time business license approval and print options, current interest rate calculations, the city of Birmingham full access to the avenue system, new licenses and renewals, avenue billing invoices. Um, as an introduction again, this is a third party company that we've contracted with to provide tax administration support services. So the agreement that we have with Avenue, uh, the City of Birmingham has with Avenue, back in September of 2019, we contracted with Avenue to provide tax collection administrative support services and also to provide our citizens with an electronic version of tax um, payment options. Uh, subsequent to the 2019 agreement, we amended our contract to add auditing services for additional fees to support our current auditing staff that's housed in the Tax and License Administration. And then in September of 22, the City of Birmingham uh, agreed to extend their contract an additional two years, so now it has a current expiration date of September 11, 2024. Uh, implementation and issues. So what I have done is structured this presentation to provide you with what's working well and what has been implemented and is not working well. So the implemented and working well for the designated avenue contact for taxpayer and city, Avenue did at the city's request establish a designated telephone number and email address for in, in, in inner city personnel as well as taxpayer um, contact. However, we have had several complaints that Avenue is not answering the calls. If they do answer the calls, they're not answering and providing correct information. They are um, giving misinformation uh, to the taxpayers. There's no follow-up as promised from Avenue, and it's creating a frustrating situation for our taxpayers. So we consistently have taxpayers that come into the city because they are choosing to not deal with the avenue uh, representatives. Or they know that the information does not con is it not exactly in line with what they know to be true with the implementation of our ordinances and tax laws. So they come to the city of Birmingham or call the city of Birmingham to get subsequent information. Uh, general license verification holds. So we established a procedure with Avenue that if someone applies for a general license, which is commonly known as the Schedule 007A, 
That means that the city of Birmingham does not currently have a specific schedule in line with or apply, that would apply to a specific business operation or service to be provided. So we place them in what's called a general license verification, I mean general license schedule, which is the 007A. With that schedule, we have requested that Avenue provide those applications, whether they be renewal or new, to, to the city of Birmingham and allow us to provide the verification necessary to make sure that these businesses can continue under this section. What is happening is Avenue has periodically release those business licenses. And once those licenses are released to those taxpayers, then the only recourse that the city of Birmingham would have is to go through some type of revocation process if the business is not adhering to the city of Birmingham business ordinances. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, Real-time business license, license approval and print options. Prior to January 2023, the city of Birmingham did not have the option to print business licenses, whether that be new or renewal, on site. Avenue has provided us with that authority through their system. However, when uh, some of the license print, they print with misinformation. So you may have a business license. It may have your name, but it may have another taxpayer's address or it may have another taxpayer's account number. So those become issues, and so through our checks and balances before we release those licenses, we're discovering that. Avenue has updated us that they're working with their, um, with their representatives, or um, uh, I forgot what they call it, uh, technology unit to try to, to try to fix this error but it consistently happens. It's not every license, but it does happen. Uh, also, our original city of Birmingham agreement with Avenue was that Avenue was going to provide a person on, on site to assist us with the issuance of business licenses that was never presented to us as an option, nor has it ever been done. Current interest rate calculations. Prior to February 1st of 2023, Avenue was not correctly assessing or calculating the amount of interest a delinquent taxpayer was, to, was due to pay to the city of Birmingham. And what that means for the city of Birmingham is if that was not caught or was not corrected, then the city of Birmingham could be um, accusing taxpayers unfairly. And that's a violation of the Constitution. We cannot do that. Um, Avenue must, and, and in addition to that, because Avenue has been incorrectly calculating this interest since 2019, Avenue is now charged with the uh, necessity of reviewing all delinquent taxpayer accounts that have remitted interest to the city of Birmingham through their system and determining if they underpaid or overpaid. Underpayments, they're going to have to go back and bill those taxpayers. Overpayments, they're going to have to go back and go through the proper refund process. Mm -hmm. To date, and as of today, Avenue has not provided us with a plan of action to correct that. The City of Birmingham full access to the Avenue system. Currently, we have access to what's called a Government um, Services Center, which is a portal or a portion of the Avenue system. Once the information from a taxpayer goes from the taxpayer to the Avenue system, then the City of Birmingham can no longer have full access to that information. To obtain full access to that information, we have to make specific requests of Avenue requesting the information that we want to see from our taxpayer information. The agreement with Avenue initially was that we would have full access to everything that Avenue sees. So if there's an issue, I'll give you an example. Uh, if a taxpayer receives a letter from Avenue that says their account is delinquent, if they contact the city of Birmingham directly, we do not have the ability to see that delinquent notice letter. So we have no idea and we are not able to provide immediate customer service to that taxpayer to offer the proper support for them to clear their account. We then have to contact Avenue to determine what the delinquency is related to. 
and then call that taxpayer back or leave them on hold. Most times it takes Avenue anywhere from one hour to three days to respond to the city of Birmingham with those requests. Um, the city is unable to determine report accuracy due to limited information availability. So if Avenue provides us with a report, then we are not able to determine if that information is accurate or complete. Uh, the, the city is not able to see payments in real time if the taxpayer pays through the Avenue online system because Avenue's system runs at least one day behind. So nothing we see is in real time. New business license renewals. Taxpayers must come to City Hall to purchase a new business license now. There was a restriction requested that Avenue not renew new business licenses. That would give us an opportunity to review the information that the taxpayer provides to make sure that it is complete and accurate. However, we are finding that Avenue is still consistently allowing taxpayers to go online and purchase a new business license. Once that business license is released through Avenue, again, we have no control over it unless we go through a revocation process. Sometimes you will find a taxpayer that is delinquent with the city, that has been sued by the city, that may have some other outstanding issue with the city that would prevent them from receiving a business license. However, once Avenue releases that license, again, unless we go through the revocation process, we cannot control them having the license. Avenue billing and invoices. In January 2023, January 26th, 27th, and 29th to be specific, Avenue provided us with a billing invoice. That billing invoice assessed the city of Birmingham an additional $185,000 plus dollars. Avenue provided no support what this was for. They still have not provided us a detailed report. And in addition to that, they have notified us that there was an error in the statement that they provided us. However, they have not refunded the $185,000 plus, dollars, nor have they provided any additional support. The remaining challenges. Our challenges come with avenues, inability to address all cities' issues and concerns in a manner that seems to work best for the administration of taxes in the city of Birmingham. There are inconsistent customer service to our taxpayers. There's a creation of exposure to city liability when provi providing inconsistent taxpayer treatment and uh, the incorrect interpretation and application of our ordinances leaves the city at risk. Avenue has proven to be a decent payment system. However, they are not tax administrators. The Tax and License Division continues to try to provide and consistently respond to citizens' need for taxpayer administration. However, Avenue has handicapped us because the information seems inaccessible to us so many of the times. Thank you, Attorney Lawson. Madam President. Mayor Whitman. Just one last note to you and your colleagues before you and give it back to them as it relates to questions or concerns you may have related to the presentation. I've spoken with the um, president and CEO of Avenue a few times over the last 90 days about desire, and that is for the city of Birmingham to be more efficient with how we engage the business license process and affording our existing small business owners and for anyone to come after them the opportunity uh, to renew their business license online, right? Not rocket science. I think the exchange hasn't been as smooth as we want as it relates to we got this service now, but it's called some other things not to work the way we want them to. So at a high level, we've had those conversations. Chief leadership's been engaged. Finance team has been walking it out. Um, the one thing I can say, there's been a cadence on more communication on a mutual align, alignment and expectations about results and producing what both parties need for us to be able to produce what we need for the small business owner. So I just wanted to give you that as far as it relates to some context, what she shared as well. Thank you very much. I will open it to counselors. I have some questions, but I'd like to start with the counselors. Have it. I am ready to explode. This report is horrifying. 
the fact that we've hired these people to supposedly do work for us and to do it better than we did, well, I think it's... I just need to take some deep breaths. I just can't believe that we're in this situation. I'm just going to cool it here for a minute. I agree. Dr. O'Quinn. Yeah, um, I knew there were problems, but wow. <laughs> so, Mayor Woodfin, what I'm hearing your, you say is that there's still some opportunity to salvage the situation? <laughs> really? We have a current contractual relationship with this organization. Um, so what I would say is that they are on notice that as a customer, we are not pleased. Uh, we have been very frank and candid about our expectations. Um, we are hoping that there is a window for those things to be solved. And then we will be in a position, based on finance department's recommendation to me, that I will be in a position to engage the Birmingham City Council. If I, if I may add, Mayor and Council, I do want to give you the assurance that because we make every effort to provide the highest level of customer service to our taxpayers, we have learned and we constantly figure out how to make it as easy and functional as possible to the taxpayers. The taxpayers, I, I feel, the taxpayers do not experience the discomforts that we do on our side. That is a very fair assessment. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, externally, what you have before you is not on display at all. Right. Um, we have our internal controls. We have our internal expectations. That's where the friction and rub is. So I don't want you to think that the small business owners are getting shortchanged. Overall, um, that's at a minimum. And when those situations come before us, have full confidence that the finance department handles that, um, or less it would have gotten to you. And then when it was, we, we remember. So I'm not going to say you all have not received things. But when it did, that's when, when I told you, I started making the calls at the highest level to lean in, you all should be receiving way less to no calls at this point, uh, but what you have with four years more internal control issues. Councilor okay. okay. Tate. I'm lost for words, Madam President. Um, I have to agree with, you know, Councilor Abbott and Councilor Quinn, you know, sitting here listening, you know, to a company that's supposed to be professionals that is clearly not professional. And then hearing, you know, you mentioned in your report, Attorney Lawson, that individuals that are doing right and those that may not be doing right are penalized for, as you say, you issue a license, somebody owes some back taxes, hey, that's, that's just another battle ground that you, you know, you got to fight on. I mean, this is just... This is outrageous. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it's just like me I, with my credit card. You know, if American Express send me a bill and I know that I, you know, I don't owe you, I'm not going to pay you. And so, I mean, this is, this is wild. I mean, seriously, you know, and people are being penalized on corporate greed, people mistakes, and that's just not fair. Because I wouldn't want to be a business owner, which I am, you know, but I, don't, I wouldn't want to be assessed any fees that I know that's, that, you know, I don't need to be paying. It's just, you know, I could think about the Birmingham Waterworks. <laughs> when you look at something like that, people are paying for people's laziness. And it, what you said, it just appears that they got some incompetent people. When you say people are, fees are not being added right, correctly, and I could be overpaying, underpaying. I mean, you know, this is a real problem. Seriously. I agree. Councilor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, so let me get this right. So we so entered a contract with them in September 2019. Yes, ma'am. And then this past September, we extended it for two more years. 
Is there a parachute for the city to get out of this agreement? Um, I'll be honest with you, uh, Councillor Smitherman, I have not reviewed the agreement to determine, you know, termination clauses. Yeah. I think that that would probably be something we could visit, revisit with the uh, Office of City Attorney yeah. to, you know, if that's something that you all would want to address. However, I do want us to be mindful and reminded that we want to be prepared to, you know, take this back on within the city and continue to offer that those convenience, some of those conveniences that did come with the Avenue contract. Okay. I'm because I'm kind of, I'm really concerned because, you know, you're giving, never mind. Well, I'm just very concerned. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's all. Well, um, and the next steps are really to see what they're going to do to address it. How many days are we going to give them to make these corrections or to improve their system and well, tactics? Well, what happens, um, Councilor Smitherman, is um, as issues and problems arise, because we meet with them weekly, we're yeah. able to present them to us. And the solutions come at various times. So if it's a solution that can be readily fixed, then they may fix it. If it's a solution that they have to go to their technology team, then it could take days, weeks, months. It just depends on what the problem is. Just like the interest rate issue, for several months they told us that you know they were not able to fix it until there was you know the concern that this may not be an ongoing contract and then a solution was had so and are there a list of other companies we are looking at since it's 2023 and it's about to be 2024 yes, in a few months okay yes ma'am i i know that um the mayor and the administration is, they are working um to come up with some in-house solutions in addition to that i've started to research some additional services okay uh the alabama league of municipal the alabama league of municipality has a list serve that they circulate information so we've started to reach out to some of the municipalities that have the same type of service however they're that are not using avenue so we're actively researching to accompany anything that the mayor and the administration may come up with internally madam president and council <clears throat> i think your i think your concern is valid and fair i think your response is spot on I want you to know I had the same response, which is why I personally called the CEO. I didn't want to talk to anybody else. Um, Madam President, four of your colleagues have a, something I've shared with them. I didn't get a chance to get to you, but I will. That has to be balanced with there is nothing else that exists. And so we're going to ride this out as much as we can. Um, and what I mean by that, um, I got confidence in the professional team in the finance department to tell us status report, progress updates, et cetera. We'll see what we can do. Um, while that question about, you know, uh, what does an exit ramp look like? You also have to consider what that, that ripple causes, which has not been determined, right? So just in consideration. Um, but the response I'm hearing from collectively from all five of you all is very warranted. Thank you, Mayor Wood. Oh, I wasn't done. Go ahead. Uh, just two more questions. Um, I guess how many, do you have a percentage or, because we really didn't get a number of how many uh, licenses are they messing up? Is it like, because you know there's a difference in 15% of them being messed up versus 75%. And honestly, Councillor Smitherman, that's hard for us to determine. Okay. And, and the reason I say that is because renewal licenses can be emailed or printed by the taxpayer themselves off-site. So we were only privileged to licenses okay. where this incident occurred here. Okay. And once we report those incidents to Avenue, then they have their development or IT team to recreate the problem. So we are never okay. privileged to how many times this may have occurred. Okay. Unfortunately. Because, so. you know, I'm, I know we all get the complaints about 
this honestly. And so I just want us to be armed, you know, and information and be telling yes, like, okay, well, you know, it's not just you. This is a problem we're trying to work on. Or maybe, you know, it's just a little glitch. So I just asked about that. And then my last one is, when can the council, I guess, get a progress update? Would it be like six months from now, three months from now? Or do you have a timeline? Let's, um, we're in the first quarter now. Let's see what we can do in the second quarter, if that's okay with you all. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilor Tate. Oh, and one more question, Attorney Law. So I did just hear you mentioned that the um, business owner can go on this platform and, and renew automatically. Will the new system that you have um, that you're, you know, maybe exploring, like, will the business owner be able to do that or will it just be where you got to come back in person and make, I'm just saying, like, to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Yes, ma'am. You good, your tax is good, <laughs> and like you said, people are printing license and they owe taxes or they delinquent. Mm -hmm. So what, I just want to know what you may be exploring. It, Will it be where that will not happen? No, ma'am. Um, absolutely, we want to continue to provide the taxpayer with the conveniences that were promised to us through Avenue and more. So the, any, any program that we would even entertain a look, you know, would have to provide the conveniences of remote access. And just making sure that you are, before you even able to print a new licensure that company needs to make sure that yes, that individual that company mm -hmm. is up to date with everything across the board yes ma'am thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much dr quinn yeah just a quick follow-up um i would assume that every business entity you know that has a license a business license per se in the city of birmingham would be um, eligible to renew their license um, through Avenue is that accurate or After are there some the contracts idea. that are just are some <laughs> businesses that are just too big to handle no sir in any business if they have purchased the initial license which is now done inside City Hall once that's done any subsequent license should be able to be renewed on Avenue okay um, so my subsequent question, which you may not if know. If they're current. Uh, let me, what's let that? me add that. If they're current. <laughs> okay. Um, so how many licenses do we have? Uh, or how many licensed businesses does or, or businesses are licensed with the city of Birmingham? Last year, and I'm assuming this was because of co year before last, we had approximately 23,000. Last year, that renewal number and purchase number dropped to about 18,000. This year, we're expecting about 25,000. All right. Now, yeah. that those businesses are housed inside and outside of the city of Birmingham. Right. So that just, I just wanted to add that. Okay. So currently around 18,000, but that could be as high as 25,000 next year. Yes. No, this year. This year, this okay. year we're expecting about twenty-five thousand. Yeah, and so I am also curious about uh, Councillor Smitherman's question about you know what percentage of that eighteen thousand are really impacted by these avenue issues. So, yeah, I, I less, less than five percent. Okay. okay. Yeah. Less Good enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. I want to just share equal disgust in what has been presented to us and um, just tell you that it does impact us because I'm in a group Leadership Birmingham. Typically what happens in Leadership Birmingham stays in Leadership Birmingham. <laughs> but I'm going to break a code on that today because on the day that we presented information about entrepreneurship and small businesses, this was the single most negative thing that was said about the city of Birmingham was this system. So we really need to work with that because even though we may feel that our small businesses aren't impacted, but when you think about what their bottom line and how they operate in a year's time and then something like this comes back and, and hits them in the face, the impact to them versus the impact to regions or to another company. So I would like to ask, I do want to echo that we 
keep this council updated on the progress of this and so that we can start somehow looking at a way to get out of this and maybe there's somebody out there listening you can create us a business and you can create an app that we can go to between now and <laughs> September next year and you know there's got to be some great thinkers out there and uh, because this is just it's damaging to the city of Birmingham and I feel as if I don't like the way Birmingham gets played by things like this. It's just not fair. And it's not fair to our, res our businesses. It's not fair to us as a city. And so even that 5% is just very troubling to me because this is how we, we operate with our businesses. And this is something that we need to regulate. So I appreciate the transparency bringing this to the council, but I do want to see deliberate speed on um, if you have to keep this CEO on speed dial, I'd like to ask that there's something we definitely do. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Lawson. I don't know, maybe we shouldn't have done this one first, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you good over there, Ms. Abbott? No, I'm not good. I know. The city of Birmingham not only has one foot in a bear trap right next to a rising river, we've got both feet and we may have both hands. It's just amazing. Now, I understand that we're going to have a report, maybe. Um, of course, it is Avenue, so we probably won't get it. But mid-March 2023 uh, is the resolution date on page 13 for the, uh, the business with new licenses, with them providing people with new licenses when we've asked them to send them here to us. Yes, so maybe we could get a report you know, at the end of March that tells us whether they've done anything because it sounds like somebody needs to be watching these people minute by minute. That's me. Yes, well, and I am so relieved that you are there to watch them minute by minute, but I'm extremely sad that no one was watching them before because they have been a mess since they walked in the door. And, and you know, we receive these complaints all the time about you know, the kind of responses that, that business people get when they talk to these folks or try to talk to them. So um, it's just very discouraging that they're still around. And, um, and, and, and just, it just concerns me that they don't seem to be able to correct anything. They're just out there bumbling around. And the 185000 of our money that they kept for services, I mean, the nerve of them with the kind of service they provide to actually keep our money without even telling us about it. Yes, ma'am. Well, again, I, we are doing everything we can to ease the burden as much as we can from within the city of Birmingham and we're actively addressing issues with Avenue as they arise as quickly as we can. Well, I see their advertisements all the time in print, and I think that they would not like a big splashy lawsuit about their competence or lack thereof. But, you know, this is just so discouraging. It just goes to show that outsourcing our jobs usually doesn't turn out so well, often doesn't turn out so well. <laughs> And I thought, I remembered, that Avenue was also supposed to be catching all the people doing business in Birmingham without a business license. Does that ever happen? Um, there, are some, there are some compliance, um, compliance audits that are performed that we found. However, I do not recall receiving a list of businesses that are operating without a license that we need to address. It just maybe comes in the form of a, their, our share of a compliance audit where they found a business operating without a license. Okay, well, you know, I know you've probably been having deep breathing lessons too, so <laughs> it just, um, oh, what a mess. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Lawson. You're welcome.
The next item we have for review is the Citizens Participation Plan, or the CPP Plan, and that will be presented to us by Deputy Director of Community Development, Alice Williams. And counselors, we um, did have this in, brought up in our administration committee meeting, and so we wanted to bring this to CLW today just to give benefit of all the counselors to look at the changes. So if you could bring us up to date, Ms. Williams, thank okay. you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Williams, and I serve as Deputy Director of Community Resource Services. I'm happy to be before you today. Today I'm coming before you with the final draft of the Citizens Participation Plan as amended by the CAB in 2022. Um, per the Citizens Advisory Board, they have asked approval of this item to, to appear before you guys, or the council, <laughs> seeking your approval on the adoption of this plan as amended. Um, and that's primarily it. They made a few adjustments and you received those highlighted adjustments. Um, they took about a year or so going through this plan to make sure that they addressed the concerns that they thought were pressing to them as a committee, and they took it before they commit before their committee, and they worked on this for about one year, and so that's primarily it. And they're just asking that you review it and that you um, agree to their amendments or um, you know make any adjustments that you need to make, and that's primarily it. Thank you. I do want to ask, what is the date they plan to bring this to the council? Ma'am, what what's the date they plan to bring this to the council? So initially, we submitted it in November, and so I know with the holidays and things, there was not a, um, you know, they may not have had time to get it before council. So I know it was submitted in November for review, and I know during that time it's kind of difficult with things going on, people being out for the holiday. But it's normally every even year, so I guess with the timeline that we received it and submitted, it kind of pushed it off a little bit. So I don't anticipate there being a rush about it because they can. Um, not, it doesn't have to be a minute in the even number of years. It says it's required to, but they also give the opportunity to make adjustments. So say you adopted it in 2023, if there need to be further adjustments, they could be. Or if there needs to be further discussion about the um, plan, it's also an option too. Right. So they did submit, and that's what they're required to do to submit it for those changes. Thank you. Counselors, we had given you the opportunity if you wanted to uh, present any questions you had or comments to Ms. Williams. I don't know if you received any of those. I, I received a few from okay. um, a couple of counselors. And I didn't know if y'all wanted to present those or you wanted me to just read through those uh, proposed changes. What's your pleasure, counselors? Would you like to just listen to Ms. Yes. Let's hear them. Let's see them. Yes. That's right. Okay. So one of the initial requests was to eliminate the proposal requirement for the city to pay for travel expenses. And that is um, noted on, let's see, I think it's page six of the plan. And the section reads, any neighborhood officer elected to represent the city shall be funded from the mayor or city council's discretionary funds to travel at related expenses to carry out his or her duties from funds other than the person's neighborhood association. So that was the first request. The next one was the CAC office election should stipulate a preference for presidents to run for president opening up to other officers only if no president accepts the nomination, establish a goal of having each officer be from a different neighborhood across the community. That was your next request. Um, the next one was change meeting requirements to run for neighborhood officer position to one previous meeting in the last 12 months, which can be waived by staff if neighborhood has poor attendance record keeping. The third one is to eliminate the petition process for officer re-election. This will encourage candidates to get out and meet their neighbors in order to run for office and thereby raise an awareness of associations and representation. The final one was state a preference for in-person neighborhood meetings except when regulated by public health safety allowances, incorporate rules and standards for other than in-person meetings, require officer training on Zoom platform prior to hosting virtual or hybrid meetings, prohibit conference call meetings, include attendance recordings, and voting procedure for virtual and hybrid meetings. And so I, I stopped before I went through the entire process, but they highlighted um, several sections that you addressed in this. So on page seven, um, there's mention of the vacancy with the neighborhood associations um, when it comes to voting. There's also a portion on here that they did not address, which was the, um, the petition ballot, but that wasn't highlighted. So some of those I didn't read back because they weren't highlighted in their request for changes. Thank you. 
Counselors, any questions, Ms. Williams? Pro Tem. And I don't know how I can ask them this, but I, I don't know if we need a meeting with them or we have to come to their meeting because I'm trying to see some of the rationale for their changes because I want to hear from them. You know, what What was your reason for that? So we can make that arrangement. This Monday we're meeting to elect the new CAB officers. So um, I don't know if you want to do it this Monday or next month. We can arrange that, um, just whatever the council's preference is. Okay. You said this Monday? Um, this Monday is the CAB election for new officers. Um, so I don't know how long that process is going to okay. take. But if you wanted to do next month or you want a time in between that we need yeah. to schedule a meeting, we can do that. We don't have to wait until March to meet about that. Yeah, I think that will be best. So we can have face-to-face -face conversation, honestly. Okay. So would um, you prefer it in their structure or would you like it at committee of the whole or another process? It will be up to the council, okay. but whatever they want to do. But I don't know if I'm the only one who feels that way, but I would just love to hear their rationale from them. What I was going to add, just typically when you have new bylaws or you have a new plan, generally you have what the old item was, what the new item was, and the rationale, as you said, or the reason for that change, what help, helps anyone approving that document to see in which direction the organization wants to go or that group wants to go and why they want to make that change. I do also agree with Councilor Pro Tem. I think an open meeting with the members of the group I would and we get this information ahead of time as far as that rationale or some of these highlighted areas, then I think that would be beneficial to all of us. I do like the idea of us meeting with them. We do, um, they invite us to each of their monthly meetings as a council and um, just to bring updates and either um, Dr. O'Quinn or I are typically there and I know Council Pro Tim has been to one or two of those meetings. So I wouldn't have a problem with making that, uh, having that as an option, Dr. O'Quinn. Yeah, um, so I want to preface this by saying uh, that I love the neighborhood association system. Um, I, I love the, the, the framework. Um, you know, I've gone on the record many times saying how much I appreciate having um, representatives in each of the neighborhoods that I serve to, to help us uh, stay abreast of you know, issues that develop um, because we cannot be in every neighborhood uh, as frequently as the residents are. Um, but the, you know, my, I, I don't have specific things that I want to point out, but my just general thoughts are, and other folks that are in the room, you know, have heard me say this before, is that, um, I was a little disappointed when I, I saw the, the recommended changes because to me um, it doesn't go far enough in, in, in thinking broadly enough about how to um, improve citizen engagement. And um, I mean, this is, that's what this is really about. And, and um, from, a, from a practical standpoint, you know, we, we would love to see every neighborhood meeting filled with residents um, engaged in, you know, public discourse that impacts their, their neighborhoods. Um, but from a practical standpoint, I don't know that we do that anymore as, as a society, um, you know, unless there's a crisis. Um, so part of me says we just need to acknowledge that and suck it up and, you know, figure out, um, how to roll with it, but at the same time, reach all of those folks that are in those neighborhoods that aren't represented in those meetings, um, so I guess what I would say is, you know, one of the things that's most concerning to me is also about the election process. You know, uh, many of our neighborhood officers have 
served in those positions for, for decades. Um, I know I had one neighborhood officer recently who tendered her resignation uh, after 40 years of, of serving. And um, so, you know, there's, <laughs> I mean, I kind of, kind of feel like in, in one sense, um, you know, I did go to the, the, the swearing in ceremony. There were lots of new faces there, um, lots of good energy in the, in the room. Um, Mayor Woodfoon was right, you know, you got to be a little bit crazy to sign up for that job. Um, but, you know, those people are out there. Um, and, and I applaud them. Um, but then there, you know, there's... It could be better. Uh, and then, then the, there was some, you know, plenty of problems from what I gather with re regarding qualifications for candidacy, um, you know, people voting in the wrong place, um, and, and various other issues. So I guess to kind of sum it up, um, I, I would appreciate the Citizens Advisory Board and, and us um, taking a sort of broader view that goes beyond tweaks and wordsmithing um, to being more visionary and imagining uh, what's possible uh, to do through this program. Thank you, Dr. O'Quinn. We have two of our counselors that have served as neighborhood president, so I appreciate Dr. O'Quinn and Mrs. Abbott has also been a neighborhood president. So uh, we know how this process can work and benefit for how the city, um, again, that community engagement piece, I think that's what I'd really like to see us focus on, but Mrs. Abbott. <clears throat> well, I am an enormous supporter of the citizen participation program because I saw it when it worked. And the big boondoggle that we ran into was when we could no longer send out flyers, despite the fact that we sent them to apartments that were vacant and, you know, where people had moved, we had problems. But when we took away the notifications, we took away the information from the people because I don't know if everyone's neighborhood flyer was like ours, but we had a synopsis of what happened at the last meeting. And we told people what was going on at the next meeting, and they got that reminder every month. Well, we were told we couldn't do that anymore. And whatever it is we're doing doesn't work, because I think we're not doing anything. You know, it's like word of mouth. Put a sign in somebody's yard, you know, don't forget the neighborhood meeting. But what I am curious about now is um, the suggestions made by the council members, have they been, how are we going to decide if we agree with each other's suggestions? Because I heard a couple of things that I said, yeah, that's a good idea. And then I heard a couple, I thought, where did that come from? So maybe that's just for the council to figure, but have you sent us a list of all the council members um, suggestions because no, we don't know what other people suggested until you just told us yeah that's just the message that I received with those I didn't receive any other ones so I was just going down that list that I had yeah. I have not submitted because I assume that y'all were discussing it amongst yourselves but I could definitely share that with you yeah yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to see those and then I guess it's for us to talk about how you know and then hearing from the CAB members because hearing the rationale for doing things for the, you know, the way they've done it, and maybe they want to hear our rationale for some of the suggestions we made, because I know that one about only having to attend one neighborhood meeting and you can run for office is going to, you know, it's going to land with a thud um, because, well, just because. So um, I guess if you can send us all that you know, the comments, I don't care if people's names are with them or not, but just to, to be able to read over them and, and contemplate them. And also, I would like for us to be provided with copies of this stuff when we hit the dais. 
this thing about everybody can have their assistants print out their own stuff, that's hogwash. You know, we have nine people running around trying to print out copies when one person could provide the handouts for the item that a person is coming to talk about. Instead of having to hunt for it on your iPad or whatever you may be using to find out which email contained the items that you need to be looking at. I don't like to waste paper any more than the next guy, but I just think that people coming before us need to bring something with them, like the avenue item that we received. You can write notes all over it if you want to. Anyway, this is just the citizen participation plan is a great plan. It needs some tweaks. We just need to figure out how we're going to tweak it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Tate. I, I really, Ms. Williams really address, um, you know, some of the issues uh, that you guys talked about. Because I'm, I mean, like Councilor Smith, I'm like, I'm hearing that they want the council or the mayor to pay for travel. I'm, I'm, I'm like, well, What's the rationale behind that, or how did, have they talked to you or said anything, you know, to you, like why they feel that that should happen? I think just with this particular item, and I don't want to speak to the rationale, but it was um, out of um, concern about the, the neighborhood funds being expended, and when there was leadership on the National NUSA board, um, you know, say a neighborhood said, well, we don't want to send anybody if they're on the national board. They wanted to make sure that member would still be able to attend. I think that's where it stemmed from. And also, out of the concern that the work they're doing is on behalf of the city to an extent. And so they felt like that could be tied in some kind of way from our conversation with them. Okay. Well, I mean, I would recommend to the council, um, you know, to really look into that and possibly seek a attorney general opinion. No. Look, look into the suggestion, and Dr. O'Quinn, did you have something? Else? Yes, I just wanted to um, follow up with a comment and say, um, over the as we've emerged from the pandemic, uh, I have often more often than not found that I am the only person representing the city of Birmingham in these neighborhood meetings. Um, in the past, there's been regular attendance by a, a CRR, a public works, representative of public works, a representative of the police department, and often a representative of Birmingham Fire and Rescue. Um, that has become a thing of the past. Uh, it, it's hit and miss now. I, you know, and, and, and the problem for us is that, I mean, I attend these meetings regularly or I have a member of my office, a staff member in, from my office in these meetings. And when you're even though I'm, you know, representing the legislative body of municipal government, um, in the residents' eyes, I still represent the city of Birmingham. Um, I'm not on the operations side, but they don't care. They don't. <laughs> doesn't make a hill of beans difference to them. You know, I'm I'm from the city, and they got questions and needs, and they want responses. Um, and, you know, perhaps it's a fault of my personality, but I generally try and respond to their questions and explain, you know, kind of what's going on that I'm aware of. Um, but, you know, all of that to say that uh, there needs to be some clear expectations of, of you know, when the, when all of those different entities are going to interact uh, with the neighborhoods because you know this is our official community engagement system um, and you know there's this expectation that city hall is going to engage through these meetings 
uh, with residents. So uh, again, that seems to be diminished uh, recently. So. so can I speak to my staff issues? So in terms of my staff, um, I have about five resource officers and they divide those 99 neighborhoods. And I encourage them, because I know as a committee assistant, to leave one meeting to go to another meeting is pointless. So I've asked them that if you have an assigned meeting that night to try to make that meeting, notify the other officers in other neighborhoods that you cannot attend and follow up with them, because they're not going to be able to make every meeting. But they have a responsibility to reach out to those officers and follow up and make sure that they address their concerns and issues and things like that. So that's what I can speak to in terms of my staff. We've also tried to make sure that if we have concerns and issues to make ourselves available during the day. It doesn't just have to be a neighborhood meeting to address those concerns. So that's something that we, we often, you know, convey to the neighborhood. And we also let them know that, you know, if you're in Arlington, West End, and you have one officer assigned to a beat, they're not going to make it to every meeting at that, you know, every association meeting because you know the structure of our meetings. So sometimes they might not call fire police until midway through or other times so I know that's been an issue so we'll try to work through that and we try to look at it through our community structure maybe starting to look at asking those people to at least try to engage on the community level so we can have more participation because it is hard for them with the shortages they experience to be in every neighborhood being have to see, get a call things like that so it makes it hard for everyone but we've tried to work with the neighborhoods and we tried to change this process but you know after 40 some years People don't want to change that process. They want it to be fire, police, this person, that person. And it kind of throws off um, what we can do to assist those folks. So we, we are looking at ways to change it. We've asked them to consider just having them come to their community meeting and address the group so they can be there with all the neighborhoods. And so that's just a suggestion we've offered. But I, I know Chief Sparks has something to Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Quinn, to your point, and Ms. Alice um, pretty succinctly stated what I was going to note, which is finding the balance to protect staff bandwidth because it is very difficult for her staff and for the respective public safety departments, public works, to cover all of those meetings in the same night. So what we've tried to do, in light of the fact that we still need to know the issues and concerns that the residents have is two things. One, in the areas where we can receive advance notice about the questions that will be asked, if they can be elevated to the CRRs, we'll get those departments to provide answers, and those answers can be reported out at the Neighborhood Association meeting. Once a concern is elevated to the point where it's beyond just a, a pre-submitted question, then we try to designate which meetings at that point we need to have a team member out to field questions from those departments. From those specific neighborhoods. Ms. Alice noted, too, that the community level would be extremely helpful, but again, it's balancing, obviously, what we know the residents are used to over the last several years. So what I would say to the counselors is if we could try that system, um, because again, staff bandwidth does become a challenge in covering all of those. So if we can provide, if you all know, and, and we've been doing this, actually, uh, we've been receiving what the op topics of concern are, and then we try to provide those updates. If you feel that's not working enough, please let us know so we can move to the next level of how much ground can we cover with staff while they both address the neighborhood concerns but are also not pulled from in the field to be able to cover those duties. And we'll make sure we try to get those concerns addressed while we look to a more long-term solution. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, um, I think all of those are great you know, courses of action. Um, I think the, the bottom line is, is that there just needs to be some clear, you know, expectations. I, I, I think it's per perfectly plausible to, you know, communicate to our neighborhoods that, look, you know, we want to provide that type of engagement, um, but we need to do it in the context of the community advisory committees and, and um, you know, I would at least uh, be open to, to doing it that way. But w regardless, just some clear expectations of when those interactions are going to happen would be very helpful. Yes, sir. That's fair. And we'll follow up Ms. Alice and her team to make sure that's clear. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So what, um, just as an action item, yes, we'll talk with you and the Monk counselors to determine what's the best time for that meeting with the members of the advisory board and also if you could collate and send those 
responses that you're receiving, if you could send that to us in writing, and so that we're all aware of um, what those comments are. That would be very helpful to us. Yes, and then we'll look forward in getting that information and then planning another meeting. Madam okay. President? Yes. Also, the mayor would like to note, too, to assist their team, is it possible that the questions that are being generated from the council office, if those questions can be coordinated amongst the council, whether through the administrator, through the administrators, and then passed on to Ms. Alice so that you all can have a record of what's been submitted by everyone? I believe we had asked for that before. So, uh, Mrs. Kidd, would that be okay if we coordinate that, those responses back to you from okay, Ms. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. And regarding the copying of uh, materials for this meeting and any other meeting, you do receive those electronically. So I thank the, those speakers that have provided that to us and um, will continue to receive those electronically. And if you have any speakers that have those materials ahead of time, you would send them to us and uh, we'll continue to work through that. Yes, thank ma you very much. Our next item is the Southtown Housing Development. And this will be presented by the Director of Community Development, Dr. Megan Venable Thomas. And I believe I see Dr. Thomas in another fact. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms. Stallworth. Yes, actually, I'll be presenting today. All right, thank you. My name is Corey Stallworth, and I serve as Senior Deputy Director of Community Development. And today, we would like to provide an update to the council on the current status of the Southtown redevelopment pro project and ways that the council can provide additional financial support to bring the affordable housing portion of this development to fruition. You all may recall in 2020, the council approved the allocation of 960,000 in home funds to support the development of a 60 unit affordable housing building on site. Immediately after approval of those funds, the Southtown Redevelopment Project, specifically the affordable housing portion, was delayed due to the impacts of COVID and rising cost of construction. Since then, the Housing Authority of the Birmingham District and its development team have been committed to developing a plan to address budget shortfalls and developing a replacement housing plan which includes a housing option for every family that would like to return to the site. And so the Housing Authority and its development partner are here today to give a high level presentation of the current status of the development and some of the uh, current financial needs. So with us today, and as I call them, I ask them to come forward, uh, is the President and CEO of the Housing Authority, Ms. Duntrell Foster, as well as members of the Southside Development Company, uh, which includes Corporate Realty, represented by Brian Wolf, the Benoit Group, represented by Eddie Benoit, Tori and Priestley, and Dale Davis, and Brick Development, represented by Stephen Heidinger. Uh, and I believe that you all have been distributed the presentation that they will present today, as well as a draft of some of the uh, financial documents we would like for you all to consider. With that being said, I will pass it over to uh, Ms. Foster. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dontrell Foster, and the President and CEO of the Housing Authority of the Birmingham District. I want to first say thank you for allowing us the opportunity for the Housing Authority and Southside Development Company to uh, present to you as we talk, discuss our Southtown Redevelopment Plan. The Housing Authority of Birmingham District um, is the largest provider of affordable housing in the state of Alabama. The development for the former Southtown Court has been highly anticipated for many years. Southtown Court had 455 obsolete units, which uh, required millions of deferred maintenance. As of what I, uh, with the responsibility that entails, we are focused on providing the highest standard of affordable housing while fostering vibrant, inclusive communities and serving as a catalyst for the opportunities, catalyst for opportunity. All of what our mission encompass cannot be achieved if we don't have, take the time necessary to redevelop and modernize our affordable housing, our full housing portfolio. By redeveloping Southtown, we're ensuring one of the largest affordable housing communities in the heart of Birmingham grows on pace with surrounding development and is structured to best serve our residents. As we go to page three in our slides, 
In 2016, the House and Third of Birmingham District procured and selected Southside Development Company to partner with us to redevelop Southtown. And we made great process, and that's in master, plan master planning, negotiating the master development agreement, securing a competitive 9% tax credit, and also receiving a 4% low-income tax credit um, deal. This progress we have made, um, this progress we made has only occurred because we kept the interests of our residents in the forefront of what we're doing. So I want to go to um, slide, uh, slide four. And slide four kind of shares the community engagement events and tools that we provided for our residents. We've created an advisory council, and that advisory council um, had, was included to our president at Southtown Development to ensure all the engagement that was occurred. She was available to um, be engaged and, and be a part of the information that's being provided to the residents. We also had our resident advisory board council and other resident community open house committees. And with that, we've, we made communication through website and social media outreaches, did di direct mail, news, newsletters, postcards, flyers, and door hangers to ensure that our residents receive the necessary information as we move forward. And as to go into our resident relocation and communication, I want to look at our slide five. And on slide five, we want to just provide history about um, the, the planning that we've done thus far and the options and opportunities that are provided to our residents. As we talk about the affordability, our resident phase was the first phase of this property. is um, allowing 203 affordable units to be constructed, and that total includes our family and our seniors combined. And these units will be subsidized and affordable to all of our residents that are wanting to return, which is, means that 60% 60, 60 of their annual medium income is qualifiable to our, resi our returning residents. Residents will pay 30% of their rent, and the Housing Authority will subsidize the remainder of their, uh, their uh, rent uh, moving as it relates to their uh, total. As we go into resident choice, so when we first started the process, we provided preliminary assessments to the residents. And this assessment allowed HBD to understand the residents' options and the opportunities that we'll provide to them as relates to relocation. When we, um, we initially started, we, um, it was 178 residents that requested to return. And this is how we determined how many units that would return on the site. Again, we've compiled a support team to assist our residents through this assessment process and also to ensure that they understood what their options were and to provide relocation services to them and what that means. And so our support team continues to work with those residents all the way through the end of the uh, relocation process. And that's ensuring that every resident has a permanent relocation. At the start of, uh, again, as we mentioned, we've had various meetings with the residents. And of course, as Mr. Starworth mentioned, there was a delay in the process when COVID hit. And so that kind of delays some of the things that we were moving forward with. And so back in, we, we started back in 2021 to engage our residents. And that was the start of our relocation for the residents. We started with 425 families on site. And out of the 425 residents, there were 218 chose to receive a voucher. 66 of those households wanted to return to one of, want to relocate to another one of our HABD properties. 37 won a private market, and 104 opt to receive the option to return to Southtown. And I want to go back to the voucher option because I want to share what that means for our residents. We have a Section 8 program, and this Section 8 program has a waiting list of an average of two to three years. And so as we go through this redevelopment, it allows our residents to receive a voucher immediately. And this removes them from the multiple year-long year waiting list, which encompasses most of our residents in public housing. And I also want to include, that's not mentioned on our slide, is home ownership. And that's one of the options that was provided to our residents. Um, thus far, we had two families that took advantage of our home ownership, and, and during this relocation, there's a benefit to that because our HEB has the opportunity to provide down payment assistance through our Uniform Relocation Act to assist those residents that choose the option of home ownership. And I also want to share that HEB is not new to the process of relocation. 
our former Lubman Village community, which is now our Villa Setitasville, we had to relocate 220 residents at that property. And with that, we had two homeowners and eight to five, eight to five vouchers. And we want to ensure that we remained in contact with all of those residents until they, they reached their permanent, their permanent location. And so we are ensuring that we do the same with our Southtown resident, our Southtown residents. Going to the return of, to Southtown, as of today, we have 98 families that want to return. We just had a meeting with our residents in January. And so within that, within that meeting, we ensure that our residents, they see the information with how we're moving forward. And within that meet, meeting, we ensure that the resident want to return, is able to return. We know most times we have a meeting, there's rarely at the point you have 100% participation. But how we're moving forward is, a, is ensuring that we have one-on-one -on -one contact with these residents to ensuring those that, didn't, that were not engaged in the meeting or in, and as well attending the meeting to receive information to ensure that we stop the barriers that are preventing them from coming back to Southtown. And so um, that is our ongoing process until the um, apartments are completely constructed. So we just want to say we couldn't be more excited about the redevelopment of Southtown and the opportunities that we provide our residents and to remain committed to provide um, wraparound services for the residents. And so, you know, as is commonly stated, you know, home is where the heart is, and we know the resident's heart is in the Southtown community, and we're doing our 100% to ensure that we make this new developed community their home. And so, I'll be able to answer, answer questions that you have, and I'm going to ask Mr. Brian Wolf to come forward to continue the, the um, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilors, do you have any questions for Ms. Walter? So you, you say that 178 families requested to return, but ultimately only 98 will return. How did that, how did the number decrease? What so it's, it's various reasons. We have some that go through eviction, some are caused through decease, um, and some just choose that because the process took so long, some actually changed their option and decided to receive an, a voucher or go to another, another one of our properties. So there's various reasons why it decreased. And we do anticipate that number to, in, to continue to decrease because we just had our meeting in, in January and we had two um, residents decide they wanted to receive a voucher because, um, and then we had another one that is over income and so they're, and a candidate for home ownership. And so we'll work with those residents to honor their option that they chose. Okay, so the other residents that chose the vouchers, not the ones you mentioned, but the ones before, do all of them have housing currently in other places? Do we keep up with them that far? Yes, they do. They do? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. you. So we do have some more of the presentation that we would like to continue. Hey, good afternoon. Brian Wolf with Corporate Realty. I'm going to skip over page um, eight because Corey did a great job of introducing our Southside Development Company team members. I'm going to skip over to page nine, which is our conceptual master plan. And as Ms. Foster said, this conceptual master plan was arrived at through a lot of um, different meetings with stakeholder groups um, that many of y'all participated in. Uh, this is going back five years ago. <laughs> but um, it was informed by residents, by different business stakeholders in the community, UAB, um, Ascension Healthcare. But essentially we arrived at a very mixed-use master plan. Um, as Ms. Foster mentioned, on Block D, which is the southwestern portion of the site, um, housing is going first. Replacement housing is coming back first. Those two projects are about $64 million, um, in their investment value, going to a tax credit deal and a 4% tax credit deal. Um, and then I'll allow um, Tori and Priestley, our partner, to come up and talk about the senior deal, and he'll also talk about the family deal as well. But I'm ha happy to answer any questions about the mix of uses, but they're pretty much well laid out for you here. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions regarding this part of the presentation? All right, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Torian Priestley. I am the Chief Development Officer for the Benoit Group. Uh, working here, I will give you a highlight of both of the multifamily and senior projects. 
Um, as you know, the, the highlight um, today is to really focus on our replacement housing program uh, for the family and also for the senior project. And it is very critical that we, you know, uh, make sure both of these projects move forward for the overall Southtown redevelopment. Uh, we believe that each of these projects will be extraordinary uh, benefit to not only the residents, but also the neighborhood. Um, when we started the, the overall master plan for Block D, uh, phase one will, will include 203 mixed income units for seniors and families. Uh, the senior building will have 143 units. The multifamily building will have 60 units. And as mentioned before, both of those will be covered by housing uh, project-based vouchers. As we start and move, move forward into uh, construction and closing uh, both of these deals, 88 of the residents will stay in block, continue to stay in block A. As we uh, start to turn those buildings over, we will relocate those families and seniors that want to uh, move into uh, block D for the senior and multifamily uh, project. On the next uh, page, I'll highlight just the senior building and then I'll go into the multifamily building. Uh, the senior building will be 143 units. Uh, as mentioned, this is a 4% uh, tax credit project. Um, again, we'll receive project-based rental assistance, and it will be geared towards uh, residents that are 62 years and older. Uh, some of the development highlights and amenities will include community room uh, with a warming kitchen, fitness center, computer center, uh, additional storage for the residents, uh, sitting areas on each floor, a leasing office. We'll have two elevators in, in our building, exterior patio, uh, facilities and sitting areas, and also will include uh, approximately about 1,000 square feet of retail space located along uh, at the corner of 24th and, um, and 9th Avenue. Uh, our uh, approximate development value for the senior project is roughly $39 million. On the next page you'll find is the multifamily building. And the, uh, I, what I forgot to mention was uh, the Benoit Group will lead the senior development um, uh, construction and, and development, and uh, the Brett Company will, will do the multifamily building. On the multifamily side, we'll have 40 unit, uh, 60 units that are under the 9% LIHTC program, and they will also have project-based rental assistance um, on that project. Some of the development amenities include appliance packages, washers and dryers, balconies with storage closets, study halls, business centers, fitness centers, uh, elevator served, club room, playground, and Wi-Fi. Uh, the approximate development value for this uh, project is roughly $24.5 million. Some critical items that are not noted on this particular um, presentation are um, particularly with the, the family project and um, some of the um, critical times that we have and why we're here today to, to talk about the overall financing for the projects is expiration of financial commitments are coming up on not only um, the multifamily but also on the senior project. Uh, the family uh, closing is required uh, to close around mid-March and then uh, completing construction before the expiration of the Alabama Housing Finance Agency's uh, commitment letter. So those are very critical to our overall process for not only the, the multifamily but also the senior. Um, with that, I will now move, turn it back over to Brian Wolf, and he'll give you a, a further overview of the uh, rest of the site. I've been asked to kind of cut it short and just allow y'all to ask questions because I know y'all are short on, on time this, this, this evening. So um, with that, all of our team members are here. We can entertain any questions about anything in the package or anything else you've heard. Thank you, counselors. Do you have any questions? Councilor Quinn. I, I, just, I just wanted to ask, um, so there's a financial gap. Are, are you guys going to speak to that? Yeah, I'll speak to it. That's what we want to get to. Right. So as we talked about earlier, um, originally there was a uh, commitment in uh, 2020 for approximately $960,000 in home funds that was going to the family deal. And as Corey kind of outlined some of the challenges that we ran into over the, the last couple years uh, related to construction prices, COVID, um, increases in uh, the interest rates, and supply chain issues that we had on projects. So what we wanted to talk about today is the, the gap financing needs for 2023. 
for the family project, we're looking at $1,761,000 uh, uh, to meet their closing for, for March 2023. On the senior project, we're looking for $1 million in Section 8, 108 loan. Uh, again, the senior project is looking about around April or May of 2023 to close. In addition, the senior is looking at a stabilization uh, support rental subsidy of $800,000. Uh, and overall, the overall gap request for both projects is approximately $3.5 million. Any questions? What? Yes, Dr. Quinn. Yeah, so um, frame that in the context of the overall cost of, of the projects. So this $3.5 million is going to be, you know, $3.5 million out of? Of $64 million, as mentioned. So the total development uh, cost of both projects is roughly $64 million. Okay. And, and, and in that $3.5 million is already including the $900 thousand plus that we that the city of Birmingham had already committed yes. okay so it's really closer to 2.5 additional that that's being requested is that accurate sure. mr. Datcher hey good afternoon Kelvin Datcher I serve as deputy director of community development this is actually a new allocation so the seven the 960 was baked in to, your, to the original pro forma prior to COVID, prior to the supply chain and the inflationary uh, costs that have been added to it. So what we're bringing for you, for you all today is new uh, gap coverage of federal funding that we have that is uh, provided to us from the federal government specifically for these kinds of programs. So this amount is, is new and is a, is, comes from uh, these kind of the, the financial environment that everyone's feeling the, uh, the brunt of the force from. Right, so, so, i.e., most of the funds are coming out of CDBG. Yes, sir. And explain to me um, how the, the Section 108 loan fund, how does that work? Is that, I mean, I assume so, it's a loan, it gets paid back? So, it, it, so I'll get Corey to do the, the mechanics of it, but basically we do want to make sure that everybody knows that all of these are our federal HUD funds, that none of this is general fund. Um, all of this is committed to us based upon the CDBG um, allocation formula from HUD, and it's specifically meant for these kinds of projects. But Corey can talk about the mechanics of 108. Yes, so uh, specifically with the Section 108, uh, it is a program through HUD that allows us to borrow against our annual CDBG uh, allocation. So it's basically a line of credit uh, to support uh, public projects like affordable housing, or even economic development uh, projects. And so the interested applicant will, will apply through community development, and then it goes through uh, HUD for a subsidy layer review as well as approval through the HUD office. And so the terms are worked out uh, with HUD and community development as well as it relates to the interest rate and the uh, repayment period. Any other questions? Counselors, I know we received this piece of the packet. This is the first time we've had the opportunity to really look at what the uh, the cost, the money. Did you send that to us already by email? Okay. Um, but I do want to allow counselors the time to digest this and we don't have four of our members that are not present. Um, I see that you would like for this attachment this to move forward on the agenda 21st or what's your next, what's your game plan? Yes, yeah, so to allow the council time to digest it and review it, we would actually like to go to council the following week, not the 21st, but the following Earth. Tuesday. All right. February 28th. The 28th. 28th. All right. Um. All right. Yes, ma'am. I got one quick question. Um, what are you guys, what are your plans to assist those that may have been your residents that, that are people with disabilities? What are, you, what are your plans on individuals that are disabled or have some, you know, some type of disability? Well, 
in each of the, the projects, we're required to have handicap accessible units, hearing impaired, and from the, the LIHTC program, that's typically 5% fully handicapped uh, and fully accessible, and then 2% um, audio visual, visual impaired. Uh, what we'll try to do is on both buildings, or what we will do on both buildings, is have uh, most uh, all of the handicapped units on the first floor. So accessibility from that perspective will be um, uh, very easy for uh, residents that, that need that assistance. So the overarching goal, if you do have some individuals that are, um, you know, with some handicaps and disabilities that you guys will make sure that you're offering some of these units to those individuals. Yes, and just so you know, all, all the units are um, fully adaptable. So at the end of the day, if you need it to uh, change out a unit or add an extra unit uh, for, for an accessible uh, person, they're adaptable where you can make that change very easily. Okay, I just, you know, I see you talking about seniors, but I didn't hear anybody, you know, mention anything about, you know, individuals with, you know, disabilities. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. In the essence of allowing us an opportunity to go through this and ha have any comments, I would like to entertain counselors that we we don't make a vote on this this evening, but we do pass this on uh, without any recommendation from the COW, but we look for it to come before us in the two weeks and allow time for comments. I'll, I'll make that right. motion. All right, you make that motion. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you all for this presentation. We appreciate the information, and we will be giving you the feedback. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, counselors. At this time, we have an update on our Family Fund Center, the project that's um, being proposed, and the Director of Innovation and Economic Opportunity, Mr. Cornell Wesley, is going to give us that update. Mr. Wesley. Good evening. Again, my name is Cornell Wesley, and I proudly serve as the Director for the Office of Innovation and Economic Opportunity. I want to make certain you all have, did receive a digital copy, an event that you didn't. I do have paper ones for you, just in case. Well, so you'll get that and get, get that to us. Thank you. So um, we are excited about this project. I've stood before you, for the, before this body, I guess no less than four times talking about this project. And we're now at the point to where we're going to pro provide a little bit more detail in terms of uh, the ingredients of pre-development. And so what we have here today is the, is the, the group that we've selected to, to execute on the pre-development of this project, the Riddle Property Group. And you will see uh, and hear from them here in the next few moments and be able to follow along with the presentation that hopefully should answer some of the questions that have been coming up in our uh, previous conversation. So, I want to bring up with me now Mr. Jeffrey Riddle, who will guide you through your presentation. Mr. Riddle, thank you. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Yeah. Again, my name is Jeff Riddle, and I'm the CEO of RPG Birmingham, and I'm joined with several members of our development team, the architects and the civil engineers and others, and we're honored to be before this body. I told our team when we first took this project on, we had a basic theme. And as you'll see in your packet, it says, for you, by you. And what that simply means is that this Birmingham Family Fund Center is for the people of Birmingham, in particular those persons that live near and around the Crossplex facility. However, we must hear from them to make it by them. So we'll have several community engagement sessions and the like. As you'll see from the screen in your packet, we've already started having conversations with the neighborhood groups to hear from them in terms of what they like to see here. And we took, went one step further, and every second Saturday, we will be here at the Crossplex with food and fellowship to hear from them. They'll talk to the architects, the engineers, and we'll get a chance to dialogue so they can be a part of the overall process so they can really feel a part of what's taking place there. The next thing you'll see is so often people say, as we've had our conversation preliminarily, I want the same thing they got in Uptown. And what we have to do is a better job of setting reasonable expectations for our community members. Let them know that although you may not have the same economics as you see 
as in uptown or other parts of the city, that does not mean you don't deserve nice, quality, decent, clean, and affordable amenities in your corridor. So that's the one thing that we promise to do with this Birmingham Family Fund Center when you look at the 40,000 square foot facility that we're proposing. The next slide you'll see is what we're looking at. We're looking at a state-of-the-art facility that's sustainable, that's clean, that's profitable, and also that's safe. Safety is a key component to anything that we do in our communities. As we go further, it's very important that we have the right team in place. And albeit I'm a bit biased because it's our team, but I think we selected a very good team with a proven track record of deliverables. Not learning as we go, but understanding how to start a project, how to finish a project, and I have constant dialogue with your bosses as you go forward. In our case, you are our bosses. The mayors are our bosses. We want to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable while also keeping you all engaged. Now, let me say another thing too. We took the liberty to talk about a business model here. Most times when I'm doing presentations, I present it before banks and underwriters because I'm financing my own development deals. And the first thing they say to me is, it's got a pencil. It's got to make fiscal sense. Will it work? So as we go through this here, we need to look at the economics of this project. Yeah, it's great. We want to do good for the community, but also are we being prudent investors with the city's resources and dollars? And I think as we go through this project, you'll see the areas that we have focused here, and I'm not going to bore you with reading to you, but you'll see from a bowling alley to a skating rink, and as we go down, we're also bringing in some practical needs in that corridor. We're there earlier today. We had lunch at Applebee's. We really drove the area to get a sense of what's going on. And we're pleased to announce that we're going to partner with an urgent care facility that will come into that corridor, rent space in the Family Fund Center, not just for those persons at the Family Fund Center, but also like today we saw the track meet going forward. People that use the various facilities to make it cohesive and inviting for all. And then also speaking of being inclusive and inviting for all, we're partnering with the Culture City to have sensory rooms for those that may suffer from autism or other issues or seniors who just need some time to decompress. Next slide. Let's talk economics. Although we're here for pre-development, we want to also look at our end goal. The end goal is a 40,000 square foot family fund center and preliminarily our budget looks at about 300 to 325 a square foot to build and then 10 percent is usually ballot or allocated for FF&E your furniture, your fixtures and equipment. So when you look at that, you're getting close to that $15 million that you all have discussed in past meetings. Next, when we look at what we're going to do right now, what we've already started doing, we've already started with the surveying and the phase one environmental. We've already started with our feasibility study. You've seen from the charts. We've already started doing our community engagements, hearing what the census tract looks like, what people can afford to pay. The old adage, you build it, they will come, we don't buy that. We got to build it and make sure they're going to come because they can afford to come. So we're doing our own due diligence, making sure we check all the boxes in that regard. So you can go through the larger list of items that are covered under our pre-development plan. As I said earlier, we believe in being held accountable. In addition to our meetings every second Saturday, we also have a start date and an end date in mind. We plan to have our pre-development completed fall 2023. At that same time, we should be able to hand over to permitting all the necessary documents to make this project shovel ready. We're no longer speculating, will it come? This is how we make it come, by having a document in hand that says we're ready for permitting. Subsequent to that, you then go to the horizontal piece of construction. Horizontal being your infrastructure, your plumbing, your piping, to make sure it flows. That's why we have our civil folk involved to show the continuity of how it all works together. And then lastly, when it's done right, we can have vertical construction completed and a beautiful 40,000 square foot state-of-the-art family fun center fall 2024. My last economic slide I want to talk about briefly is understanding the numbers. And we took some liberties here. Let's say the 15 million is for construction. 
we valued about five acres to eight acres needed for the land at a million dollars, and then a million for, for pre-development, for a debt service, if you will, of $17.4 million. In order to make that number work from a business side, the city will say, okay, what do we need to do to make sure we get a return on investment from the business side? We took the liberty to say, okay, if the city is expecting a 6% interest rate for its money, what does that look like on a monthly basis? And that looks like $85,000 a month. And that seems like a high number. However, what we've done is break down how do we get that revenue. Next slide. How you get that revenue is by making sure that each of the venue participants, if you will, the bowling alley, the skating rink, eSports arena, those are income generators. Steam being affordable for the residents and the community, but also generating revenue to make sure it makes sense for the city of Birmingham. And we've gone through and broken it down to get to that $85,000 per month. The last thing I want to talk about is job creations. And some may argue, well, how does that deal with pre-development? Well, when you start, you should see again what's the objective. And job creation that corridor is very important. If we do this right, which we will, we should create about 75 plus jobs. In addition, we will help close the health gap in an area that's considered a medical desert. And then lastly, we'll also do good by the community while doing well economically for the city of Birmingham. We thank you all for this opportunity, and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions, Councilors? Ms. Zabbitt. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation, and it sounds really exciting. Um, and I was happy to see the $85,000 a month. I was uh, hopeful that you could talk about the uh, maintenance part of this facility. For instance, are we going to build it with materials that don't require maintenance? No, great question. What we've factored in our budget is a net of 85000 to the city. So the city may want to third party it out. Earlier you made reference to not being the biggest fans of outsourcing a lot of the city services. So if you'll note in my notes, I scratched that out to say, oh, let's not be so quick to outsource it. But in a case like this, you want to hand it over to the professionals. And if you hand it over to the professionals, they will say to the city, no problem. We can pay you 85000 a month net, no problem, because we're going to make even more based on our operations, based on our marketing and the like. And that maintenance, CAM, et cetera, will be charged separate and apart from the city's $85,000 net per month. So it is factored into it, but it won't be charged to the city. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I'm interested in the construction because if you construct using certain materials, your maintenance is not so much. And if you, like, put a flat roof on the building and it leaks every week, then your maintenance is a lot. But if you put a metal roof on the building, it might last for 50 years. And, you know, our maintenance costs or whoever's, somebody's maintenance costs would be reduced by the construction materials that we select. Great point. And that's why we have pre-development and the people behind me, the architects, the engineers, making sure that we build a sustainable, practical, and environmental friendly building. You talk about flat roofs. A flat roof only means not will it leak now, is when it's gonna leak. It's gonna leak no matter what. So we gotta make sure we do all that right. And the materials that we use, there are so many materials that we can use that are friendly to the community, friendly to the environment, and still economical. So we'll factor all that in during our pre-development process. But right now, I'm not versed to give you all that because we haven't finished all of our pre-development costs in that regard. I just, have I just want to make sure it's thought about Absolutely. because we're, we're not known for maintaining what we own. And so since we're not known for it and since we're elected officials and the next person who gets elected may not care about maintaining our facilities either. I mean, we need to build things that don't need much maintenance so that we don't reap the unfortunate consequences of not maintaining our stuff. Yes, ma'am. And as I said earlier, you have a team that's on the other side as well because we write checks in building buildings and we understand the importance of deferred maintenance and the cost associated with that. So we want to make sure that when we present back to you all on an ongoing basis, you see that we've factored into the cost 
of maintaining this facility and deferring that for times to come. And building that back into Good. whoever's managing it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any more questions? Any more questions? Councilor Quinn. Thank you. Um, so, yes, very good presentation. Um, I think you touched on uh, a lot of the things that I've been interested in um, concerning market evaluation. Um, I would very much like, uh, very much appreciate seeing the actual market study. Um, because, you know, my concern is, is, is exactly what you said, you know, um, that we, we do something that is actually, you know, based on um, an analysis that we know uh, from a business perspective can, can actually, you know, return, be a good investment for the community and at least, you know, pay for itself. So, again, I, I very much appreciate um, sharing the, the market evaluation with us. Ditto. But we will have real-time Dropbox available so you all can see the ongoing from surveys to phase ones, market analysis as well, so you can see what your money is going towards. So, awesome. yes, sir. All right. Any other questions? I just, I, I yes, just, Councilor Tate. I just have a comment. Thank you, Madam President, um, and to Mr. Wesley and the team that you have assembled to um, carry out this project. I love what you say for you by you. Yes, ma'am. I like it. I like collective moving because I live by a slogan, nothing about us without us. And so I like how you get in the community, you know, engage and get in their feedback because, as you stated, it's super important um, that you you going out there and you, you know, bringing this fund center. And it's important to have the voices of those that live in these communities. And I think a lot of times when, you know, people do projects, it's all it's driven by ideas of what they think and not engage in community. So I really like, want to commend you on, you know, the presentation and the for you, by you, and, you. and engage in the community. Well, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Pro Tem. Uh, it's, it's just really a comment. I'm, I'm really very excited to see this happen on the west side of Birmingham. Um, because we don't have anything like that, honestly, in the city of Birmingham and really on the west side. Because once you get past maybe to this field, maybe West End, there's nothing else. And so you get to the far edge of Birmingham, going to another municipality. And I agree with Councilor Tate. I'm glad we're getting the input of the people so they can feel included because they'll be the ones using it. I mean, we'll use it too. But I'm, I'm just really excited to see this for them. I'm really glad we're able to finish out Larry Lanford's vision because that was his vision, the last part of Crossplex. And, you know, we... We owe that to the people over there. They need that. I think that'll give them some hope, something for our kids to do. Uh, event Space Center, helping people out. I know we don't have that many event spaces in the actual city of Birmingham, maybe the Sheraton, maybe the Weston or something like that. And I think they're booked out two or three years. So I'm really excited to see this. Uh, skating ring parties. I know we have one skating ring is out on 280, but I think it's really good to bring those services to people here. Um, I know Mayor Wolfen has a slogan, um, there's always something happening in Birmingham, so now we'll have different services for them every weekend. Right. So when we have visitors to come, they say, hey, I want to go skating. Come over here. Hey, I want to go bowling. Here we go. And when families come in for these different sporting events and stuff, we'll have stuff for them to do. So I'm really excited about this. You know, y'all have my support and, you know, half of us live on the west side. So I enjoy taking a 10 minute uh, ride to go meet Councilor Tay over there for some bowling and Councilor Alexander to be here in some arcade games. So thank you. Well, thank you all again. Madam President, thank I, you. I, I do have some skates, okay. really, seriously, all because right. I, I did a skating party. When did we do it, Councilor Quinn? It was back in December, right? Yeah, and we, we, it's an appetite for skates. Okay. I got some brand new skates in the back seat of my we'll car. We'll be ready for you next year. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Dr. Quinn. Um, you're Mr. Riddle, right? I am. Okay. Um, just wanted to get that right. Um, so one of my colleagues that's not able to be here tonight um, sent a couple of questions. Will RP, is it RPG? Yes. Yeah, all right. 
Okay, rocket propelled grenade. <laughs> well, 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 our RPG uh, provide construction administration services throughout the construction phase. We would gladly we, that, do that if we're hired for that service. As of right now, we're engaged for pre-development, but okay. I would defer. Just to clarify, we can't utilize the unit. Um, okay, so that will construction administration services will have to be bid out as part of the project. Okay, um, and this is probably also a premature question, um, but if you if you all are selected, I would assume, uh, would you be able to help the city identify a third party management entity? Absolutely, yes, sir. Okay, prior to the facility being built. Correct. That's part of the pre-development when you interview and you vet folk out. You'll so that know. is part of the pre-development? Absolutely. We will look at end users and how this will come in play because it's important they have a voice in the planning and design. If we're asking someone to manage it and operate it, right. they should understand, like the community, how it will flow. So they right. can be profitable as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, so construction and administration yet to be determined and yes to the identification of third-party management entity prior to the facility being built. Correct. Got it. And also the acronym RPG means Riddle Property Group, so. Right, I, I, I know. <laughs> All right. Thank you, any other questions? Well, I want to echo the same sentiment of my cousin districts over here, um, <laughs> six and nine, in that um, bringing this to the western area of Birmingham is very exciting for me. Growing up in that area, I think we used to pass by no, no one in this room probably knows this place. It was called Funland or something over there. And it wasn't a place Kitty, of... Kitty Land. Kitty Land. Kitty Land. And so, um, you know, it always wasn't open to everyone, but it was a place that people could come and bring their families. So to increase this and have this opportunity for the families of the western side and all of Birmingham, we want everybody to come. Right. But um, I do thank you for the presentation, and I do, I want to encourage you with the community engagement piece and I'm going back to what Councillor Tate said for you by you just to be sure that it's just not something we're dreaming up but I believe it's all started from residents saying can we have this can we have that can we have this so I'm um, excited about the community engagement piece of it and thanks for answering those other questions I looked at your pre-development phase that you had talked about and I'll get through y'all I know everybody wants to get out of here um, but is that sustainability part of the pre-development is that answering some of the questions is that the part sustainability that in that instance refers to green environmental friendly okay. Okay. people that sustainability long term is a separate as a mere reference okay right. thank you very much all right councilors thank you very much thank we you appreciate your presentation thank you thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you all at this time we do have uh, old business and new business i will ask i believe it's going to be um, miss argo you're going to come forward with the raise grant Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Good, afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. Evening, Good yes. <laughs> Christina about. Argo, um, um, serve as the Strategic Projects and Innovation Division Manager with the Department of Transportation. So thanks for having me today. Um, I'm here to ask for um, your support for the city's USDOT raise grant application and that corresponding um, match. And um, so to kind of set the stage for the project that we are we are um, going after, um, I'd like for y'all to think think about how our city has been shaped and has grown in the last hundred years, and in terms really of our um, transportation system. We have designed a city that is very auto-oriented, and this is not unusual to, to many cities in the United States. And when you think about that, the fact that only about one-fifth of our population owns a car, a very small percentage of our population uses um, public transportation, and we have limited, enhanced pedestrian, bike, and transit facilities across the city, you know, it's really our belief that now is the time for us to begin making 
begin making changes to our street network and our transportation system by deprioritizing auto-oriented design solutions and instead supporting the creation of a walkable and a connected city. So we're not going to be able to transform the city um, overnight. That's 100 years of growth we're looking at. But um, this project will create active, multimodal transportation options um, while also connecting several neighborhoods, cultural, and historic sites. So um, to get into the nuts and bolts of the project, I believe you guys have the executive summary and have seen the map for the project, um, <clears throat> is a 2.64 mile corridor that encompasses an urban trail, um, a complete street, and, and an improved transit corridor. And so we are connecting essentially from City Walk, which, which is on the edge of the Fountain Heights neighborhood, um, down 16th, 16th Street all the way to Morris Avenue. And then um, the east-west leg of that runs down 5th Avenue, Graymont Avenue, and goes all the way to um, Legion Field. Um, and so of that, 0.68 of the almost two miles, or over two miles of, of project, two miles is the complete street portion, which is that east-west connector, and then we've got the north-south portion, which is the urban trail connection. Um, and, and some of the images here can illustrate what the, if you look at the back page, so we've got the urban trail concept there along the top, and then what this complete street corridor will look like with enhanced transit stops. Um, total project costs come in at $29.4 million. Um, we are asking for a $4 million match from the City of Birmingham ARPA funds. Um, and the total federal request for money comes in at $21 million. $21.6 million. So, and I'll pause and, and take questions. Thank you, Ms. Argo. Um, and then, do you have a date that you have to have this submitted to? February 28th. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Counselors, any questions regarding this item? Uh, yes, Dr. O'Quinn. I'd just say that the Transportation Committee uh, heard this last month and then a follow up uh, this past Monday. And um, on Monday, we voted, the, the Transportation Committee voted to recommend to the full council for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Council Protam. I was just thinking about the community engagement piece. I know you're just applying for the grant. Just if you have talked to the neighborhood, are there any concerns about, I guess, changing the, the um, layout of Graymont Avenue, for example? I see it's turning into one lane. Is that correct? It'll be two lanes. Two lanes. So we'll go very from wrong. Okay. Very wide, four lane, um, with a turn lane to two lanes in a turn lane. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so we have, um, we will be conducting a lot of community engagement as okay. part of the design process. So Absolutely. there'll be a lot related to you know how we're transforming the street. A lot of engagement related to the historic district because there's a lot of historic. Um, you know, buildings and, and other structures that we're going to have to pay close attention to. So there'll be there'll be a lot of public engagement. Um, this project did come out of several other plans that had extensive public engagement already, and these are projects that came directly out of those plans. So we do have you know some historic community support already for these for these projects for this project. Okay. Well. I I love this idea because, you know, we're we're known for being the civil rights hub ourselves in Montgomery. But I think giving more people uh, options and more of di a direction when they want to know more about civil rights because it's much more than BCRI and the church. But now they can explore really majority of the city and really it'll tell a story by really just walking and eating, and that's, that's how right. most major cities are. So I'm excited about this. Great. Anything else? Mrs. Abbott? Yeah, I wanted to ask, is this part of the Red Rock Trail? The Redmont Trail. Red Rock. Oh, oh Red Rock, sorry. Remember the Red Rock It is. Trail? So um, a little background on that. So Freshwater Land Trust manages our Red Rock Trail system. They have just recently gone through a planning process where they identified 10 key corridors that will help us connect the city 
from east to west, so essentially Ruckner Mountain to Red Mountain Park. And this is one of their first key corridors, and so we thought this was a great place to start and start building, connect, finishing that east-west connection across the city. And will the um, pedestrians and cyclists be protected in any way from the vehicular car traffic? They will be. That, that sometimes veers off and goes somewhere it's not supposed to go. It will have a, um, a concrete buffer. It's hard to see from this drawing here, but there's a concrete buffer on Graymont Avenue that is proposed all the way down the corridor. And then the urban trail piece will be a separate path altogether, and I believe we have enough room to have a planted, um, you know, a landscape area with trees that would separate that path from car traffic. Well, that's good because, you know, since the pandemic started, people's driving skills seem to have just really just <laughs> fallen off completely. And, uh, and it's a nationwide thing. It's not just us. But, boy, I've seen some strange accidents where you just wonder if people are still thinking. <laughs> well, I didn't really touch on the safety component of this, but that is one of the key elements we're addressing with this project. So not only like the creation of these spaces, but it's a safe space for other modes of transportation. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Quinn, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask about, um, so we know the submission deadline is February 28th. Um, what does it look like after that, I mean, how long typically does it take um, these things to, to get evaluated for us to know if we've made the first cut or? That's right. Um, so submit at the end of the month. Um, it would take probably three to four months to hear back. So we, we hope in the summer. And mm -hmm. let's say we get the money and we'll just, we'll, you know, get contracts in place and hopefully begin the actual process next fall. Okay, and um, these are very competitive uh, awards, as I understand it, and so um, do we have a plan B for the $4 million? The, so if we don't get this grant, what are we going to use it for? Right. Well, we have... Um, because, because there is a, you know, a, a time limit on our use of the ARPA dollars, so... That's right. Yeah. So, we have... Been, are you want to... Go ahead. Um, so, the way that we, I guess, gained approval to um, use the $4 million was in working with our administration. And so, if this grant is not awarded, um, I think it would just kind of go back into that process of working with the administration to figure out how it's allocated. So we do not currently have a backup plan for $4 yeah. million. One, one thing I'll just say to my colleagues, uh, earlier today, uh, Christopher Hatcher sent out um, information about the ARPA flex that was included in the omnibus bill that was passed last year by Congress. Um, so long story short, when ARPA first came out, um, transportation infrastructure projects were not an eligible use of the funds. That has changed, mm -hmm. and this is one of the projects that's being proposed as a result of that flex legislation. That's right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilors, I know um, this was brought up as the old biz new business in the budget and finance, and um, transportation has already reviewed this item. Would you like to entertain a motion and a second to move this forward to the full council with approval, or we can just bring yes, this one up? I, I move that we send it to the full council with our recommendation for S approval. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much, Ms. Argo. Yes. And yes, excuse me, this will be on Tuesday's council agenda. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, councilors, we do just have one other item, and uh, Dr. O'Quinn wanted to give us some updates. He's been working on uh, some legislation that would um, help to uh, pro prohibit source of income discrimination, and so he just wanted to give us an update on that. Go ahead. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, just this is just a, a courtesy. Um, so over the past year, I uh, have been working to um, advance 
uh, a potential update to our city ordinance that would uh, address source of income discrimination. And, and immediately following this meeting, uh, I w I'm going to send you a, a very good summary of what that is um, from the American Bar Association. But simply put, um, there are many people uh, who have a, a non-traditional source of income um, whether it's for, for specifically for housing and, and a lot of times that takes the form of a military housing voucher or um, more commonly what most people you know, think of is the housing choice voucher or what's commonly referred to as section eight. Um, and you know, people who use or who are awarded those vouchers are often faced with discrimination often even before they can get into the door of uh, a potential landlord. Um, so it's not a new thing to prohibit discrimination based on source of income. Um, the article that I'm going to be sending you later, you know, takes us all the way back to the 70s uh, when municipalities across the United States started enacting this type of local legislation. So long story short, um, I, along with several other uh, partner organizations, including the Birmingham Association of Realtors, would like to bring a uh, proposed ordinance before the council in April, uh, specifically April 11th, uh, which is a Tuesday um, for the council to consider. And the reason why that date is important is because that is the 55th anniversary of the signing of the Fair Housing Act. And um, Birmingham Association of Realtors is going to have programming all during the month of April related to uh, that anniversary. And I think that would be an appropriate time for us to, to take up consideration of something like this. The second thing that I want to um, mention to you all, and the reason I uh, paused Director Fowler at the door, is, is that earlier today uh, we received a report from BJCTA. So um, we passed contract. Was that last week, I think? Um, but in that contract, there's a, a paragraph on reporting, and it requires monthly reports to be submitted uh, to the city. Um, so I intend to also forward that report to you all. Uh, but I want you to know that um, Director Fowler and myself are actively engaged in conversation with BJCTA um, about how to improve that report to create the type of transparency that we need um, to better understand you know, what service uh, BJCTA is delivering to the city and, and how people are using it. So, Based on my skimming over it earlier, I, I think it's improved over what we've received previously. Um, but please know that that's not the final product, that um, we're, again, actively engaged with conversation with them, trying to, to get that honed in. And that's it. Well, I'm glad to see that collaboration between the Department of Transportation and the Transportation Committee, because I know they have given us different reiterations of what they thought was a good uh, process of keeping us aware or, or informing us uh, of you know, how they're meeting their goals and how they're doing as an organization. So I'm glad to see that collaboration, because then you can be a voice of, this is what we really need to see. Yeah, and this is how to really manage. You know, it. and I'll just say that um, I, I think that you know I haven't seen this level of cooperation before, and um, you know I think we have a new, a, a unique situation with um, 
Charlotte Shaw at BJCTA. Um, you know, she she is the first director that I've encountered um, that's been a, been open to having this level of dialogue with the city. So um, I think it foretells of good things to come. Thank you. And thanks for those updates. And before Councilor Pro Tem asked me, yes, we're going to have that committee. I'm just waiting to get with um, Mr. McDaniels just to write the um, documents that would set the establish the committee. But uh, we were looking at the housing, establishing that housing committee. And uh, we'll retire the um, COVID and the redistricting committee. And then we can put that committee in place. So you'll get more information about that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. O'Quinn, for bringing these updates and uh, working on this as well. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Did you say the Board of Realtors was going to bring an ordinance to us? No, no, no. no. I, I, I've, <laughs> I'm They're, confused about that. What are they doing? <laughs> so, so um, as I, you know, began to, to ponder this, uh, and you and you'll see in the American Bar Association, you know, amongst their recommendations that they have for municipalities that may be considering in, enacting this sort of legislation, they recommend you know assembling uh, a group of supporters. Um, so. I approached the uh, Birmingham Association of Realtors um, because they represent a very large portion of the private real estate uh, interest in, in the metro area. Um, so um, my first concern was, was, okay, can we do this under the Alabama state constitution? Is this a privilege that's afforded to municipalities in, in the state of Alabama? And the answer to that is yes. And then my second question is, um, will the private real estate market uh, go along with it? Um, so they have uh, given their endorsement um, and they're, you know, part of the group that um, intend to um, bring forward to, to speak about this issue and why it's important. And so our legal department will see it and bless it. It's been submitted to the Office of the City Attorney uh, for evaluation, and um, we're looking forward to their review. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Abbott. Again, thank you, Dr. O'Quinn. Councilors, we can entertain a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn.